study tonight, I want to first take a moment on pre-briefing everybody on why this mysterious and yet most necessary aspect of God is so critical to our oneness with God and our overall belief system. Captured inside this one verse are three mind-boggling truths that if, in my opinion, faithfully applied, it makes so much spiritual sense. And we need this because it speaks to the identity of God, God's character, and the fullness of God. Now, I in my own am not able to deliver such a message with much clarity, especially the points that you were here tonight. But God, as our pastor always says, but God is faithful. And it's by his wisdom and his power and understanding that such a topic will be broached with that assured blessing that only the Father from above can and will give. So our study for tonight will begin in the first book of Moses, the book of Genesis, captured in chapter 1, verse 26. If you're not there already, I will encourage you to turn there, but it will be on the screen as well. So as the Word of God reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And I dare not go at this alone, so now let's pray. <sighs> Loving Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you so much for providing this opportunity for us to assemble together, bring us together one accord for one reason, and the only purpose is to hear your word so would you just extinguish all emotions and all things that may have plagued us throughout the week. And at this moment, allow us to be still so that we may hear you and hear you well. And by the power of your might, speak in our lives. In the name of the King of Kings, Jesus, the Christ we pray. Amen. With the Lord's permission, we will be discussing the Godhead or the Trinity, along with the greatest creation by God, and with that, the greatness of God. Very simple topics. <laughs> Too easy, right? No, it's, it's broad. It's very broad. But nevertheless, it's my sincere hope that at a minimum, we would gain a better perspective of why this is so important when it comes to Christianity, because it is. It's so important, in fact, that many people skip over it, deny Christians the opportunity to really understand the Bible, to really know the authority of the Bible. And that's one of the aspects of the Trinity that we're going to get into. So. I also hope that after the study, that we all go away, the Lord would minister to us as individuals and we'll come back together with other ideas and other things that the Lord has revealed to us individually so we could uplift one another further proving the scriptures. So the word Godhead is only appears on three occasions in the King James Version of the Bible. In the book of Acts chapter 17 verse 29, the book of Romans, chapter 1 and verse 20, and Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. And when you have the opportunity, I encourage you to read these passages along with the surrounding text and its context, and you will be blessed indeed. In addition, and this is not a disclaimer, but I would tell you this, is that any time that we are at a Bible study or reading God's word, learning it, or having someone teach it to us, speak it to us, it is our duty as individuals and Christians to search the scriptures for ourselves and do not rely on man to bring you God's word. Rely on God to bring you his word. So make sure that you do that and I do it. And that's not a disclaimer, but I'm just saying, as a man, I could let you down. But the word of God will never let you down. So trust in the Lord when it comes time to study it. Just hearing the pastor talk about greater condemnation for those who are leading the flock, 
sends chills down my back for a good reason. Because I have a, a job to do and hold at a standard, I get it. So I do my best to diligently study the word, as you should, to show thyself approved. So don't rely on man. It is God's word. Now, as we got that down, and as we begin our study in verse 26 of Genesis 1, it is also important to review the very first verse in the Bible in terms of the word God. As many of you know that our English translation is not always on par with the Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Greek, Latin, and so forth. So every once in a while, it's especially when we get to areas that may contradict, it's good to look up the original text and find out what those words mean because a gold mine lies behind it if we do that. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to be scholars in Greek, Hebrew, or whatever language. We don't have to be a scholar in that, but oftentimes it is good to look at it. And remember that a lot of people will want to try to challenge that and say, well, you don't know I am Dr. So-and-so and I've been studying this, that, and the third for mega years and here's what it really, listen, that's not what the Lord said. It's not what he said at all. In fact, if we read, it is written. And he said, speaking of Jesus, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never, that word is, and that word in the Greek, Aramaic, and the Hebrew is the same. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Children. That's not like we're childlike minds don't have an idea or a clue. This is being submissive to the Father. That's all it is. And we have to have that mindset and not get ahead of ourselves. And many people think their degrees put them above God. They are sadly mistaken. So we want to make sure that we understand that we don't have to be scholars we can look it up and what the Lord puts on our hearts to find a hidden message. <clears throat> I don't think that's important. So, and there's a lot of other stuff you can put in that Matthew 18, three, but that's just one of them. So anyway, as we go off, we're gonna back up 25 verses and get to the first verse of the Bible. And remember, we're talking about in terms of the word God. My clicker doesn't work, but that's all right. That worked. So, the word of God reads, in the beginning, God. This is the first part. In fact, the greatest opening of mankind. In the beginning, God. God. And it's the word God that we're focusing on. Because the word God in the Hebrew tongue is Elohim. So, this is is the plural name for God, and not gods as in separate gods, but an all-encompassing meaning for the true and living God. In addition, this plurality that we see is not like we have in the English, where plural is two. Elohim equates to three. So when you look at that, and we understand this, it's significant. Here it is in the beginning, Elohim. This is what we see. In fact, the word Elohim is mentioned almost 700 times in the Old Testament alone. 700 times. Now, one would think that why would God put that there so many times? It's repetitive to let you know that it's probably important. Take a look at it. Elohim, the plural name for God. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, a deity of three, yet one, as we will see, and the Bible confirms it over and over again. Now, with this in mind, let us return to our text for tonight, verse 26 of Genesis 1, and expound on the word of God as he has provided for us this evening. And the word of God reads again, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, these are not typos. This is not scribal errors or some figure of speech. This is not a form of poetry to entreat the reader. Sounds really poetic. Oh, that's nice. It's not what it is. 
It is what it is. From who said it? The great I am. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. He's not talking about angels. And that's for certain. In this portion of the verse, we are reminded three times of God's majestic plural nature. Three times. This doesn't need a translation at all. And from the onset, what we can see is more involved in this passage of scripture. If fully accepted, it makes so much spiritual sense. Right here speaks to the blessed Trinity or Godhead and so much more. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the third person of the Trinity and for good reason. The Holy Spirit is rarely spoken about. And most of our study tonight is going to be on that. It's going to culminate to Jesus Christ and the connections with all. And of course, God himself who ordained it all. And then hopefully we'll tie it in at the end and see why it is so critical. It is very critical. And I think we'll get it. No question about it. The Lord will deliver. So, first of all, we know that the Holy Spirit is God in spiritual form. And there's requirements in order for that to be. We know from the scriptures that the spirit of God was with God from the beginning because the Bible says in verse two of Genesis one <clears throat> that the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters or moved over the face of the waters as some translations read. There's no question, as if, to, if the Holy Spirit was in the beginning, the Word of God speaks of it. And why is this important? Well, in order for one to be God, it must possess God's independent, almighty nature, that being eternal and not created, able to create as God, control all as God, and give life as God, and yet never be separated from God. Those are some hard attributes. And we all fail miserably in any of those, and anything you could think of fails. But as we look at the Holy Spirit, we see that he contains every element of these qualities. And we're gonna review some of them, and I'm quite sure you'll find more in your own independent study. But let's look into the creation with one example coming from the book of Job, chapter 26, and verse 13. It'll be on the screen as the word of God reads. By his spirit he adorned or garnished or made, made neat or set, set aright the heavens. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. The second part is not a part of our study, but I don't want to run over verses like, hey, what was, what was that we just said? So... For 10 seconds, we're going to address the second part. It's been many, many things talked about the second verse of what it means. And a lot of them go so deep, it's, it's beyond my, my capacity. So I'm simple when it comes to the Bible. It just says, he, he, his hand pierced the fleeing serpent. So the interpretation that we have come to, and I mean myself and the Lord ministering to me, is simple. Ever since the fall of Satan, he has been fleeing from God. Simple. I think it fits the narrative. Many people may argue and say, well, the constellations of the stars rendered this and there was a picture of this and that. Look, you know what? Congratulations on that insight. But that's not what, the God, God, well, that's not what God has ministered to me. It's very simple. Flee. And he's been fleeing. Now, the devil may come after us, but the Lord says in James 4, 7 that <clears throat> resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we have the opportunity to resist, and God will be faithful in that as well. So it all makes sense. But anyway, don't want to get off track too far. So as we continue with the Holy Spirit and its independent work in regards to creation, we also read in the book of Job, chapter 33, and verse 4, the following. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The creation of man by the Spirit of God. This is what the Bible says. The Spirit of God has made me. Work, independent, 
yet unilaterally agreed upon. This can only come from God. That's it. No willpower or man can even make this up. It's the word of God. Throughout the scriptures, the Holy Spirit continues to show his unique, independent nature throughout the scriptures, old and new as we will see, yet always connected to the Father and the Son, never to be separated in their work and a complete participant in all that was and is and is to come. I'm going to come back to this verse here in a second. The Word of God continues to speak of the Holy Spirit's involvement in creation captured in the book of Psalms, chapter 104 and verse 30. So the Word of God reads, you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth or ground. Another example of the Holy Spirit conducting the works of the Father with the full authority and power of the Father. And that power of the Father includes the power to give life as well. As we go back to Job 33, 4, he says that the breath of the Almighty gives him life. And this breath is not some simple exhaling of some sorts. What comes from this releasing from one so holy is none other than the Holy Spirit. And Job understood this. He clearly understood it. And it is again written by the power of the true and living God in the book of Psalms, chapter 33 and verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. And again, also in the book of Job, chapter 27 and verse 3, we read, As long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God is in my nostrils, that's where that ends at, and verse 4 continues, with my lips will not speak wickedness. My point is, in regards to the ability the Holy Spirit has, it's not limited to creation, also has the ability to give and sustain life. That is critical. And this breathing that's spoken of by Job was just referred to as the Spirit of God in my nostrils. It's the Holy Spirit himself in action, not just creating again, but giving life. Eternally agreed upon, and I will repeat that over again, agreed upon, and God himself displays the ultimate separate collective power captured in Genesis chapter two and verse seven, as the word of God reads, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul or a living being. This is what Job was speaking about. You see how separate but always connected. You will find that throughout the scriptures. And again, you'll find more as you do your own study. And I look forward to hearing what the Lord has revealed to you. But what was breathed in man it's nothing but the work of the Holy Spirit, God ordained. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, possessing all the full attributes of God in every respect, yet always being connected to God without separation, and the Son, Jesus Christ. Here God creating man and his breath giving man life, independent work, never to be separated from the Holy Spirit. His Spirit gives life. And we know this from the scriptures. The spirit gives life, and this is the New Testament. The flesh counts for nothing. The word I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. The spirit gives life. And in the book of Romans chapter eight and verse two, we read the following. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And not as if we needed to see more, but also in the epistle to the Galatians chapter 8 and verse 6, the apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit would pen these words. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, capitalize, from the Spirit will reap 
eternal life. After these examples, and there are more, where's the debate? In fact, why is there a debate in the first place? God infused power of the third person of the Trinity, being the Holy Spirit, by its divine self yet forever united to the true and living God and the Son of Man. There is no debate. Okay, but there's a debate about this. Who can accurately talk about the Godhead of the Trinity in every aspect? Who can give every concept of this majestic authority? I'm not claiming to. I'm not saying that I can give every aspect of it. Nevertheless, completely understanding how this works is vastly different from understanding the concept of its existence. Understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. Understanding all the ins and outs of how it works is irrelevant. That's irrelevant. But do you get the concept? That's the thing. Are we with our limited knowledge designed to comprehend all things? We could take the greatest minds in the world, past, present, put them all together, all together, take out, digitalize it and anything you can think of to get all their knowledge brought up and bring it to the footprint of God. And it is nothing, nothing. So what does the, Bible's, what does the Bible say in regards to this? talking about the notion of trying to know everything and have everything, understanding what God works is, what his works are about. Well, one of my favorite found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25 and verse 2, it's the word of the Lord says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Now, this means many different things but it fits the narrative for our study tonight as well. We're not here to know everything. And we best believe that the things that the Lord chooses to conceal are for our own good. But he reveals more than enough for us to get the point. The real question is, do we really want to get the point? That's what the question is, or it should be. Or do we want to lean to our own understanding that fits what we deem it to be? Is it that we have selective hearing or better yet, selective judgment or reasoning, all based on how we feel. It seems like we always are so emotionally driven by us being scripturally inspired by the Holy Spirit. This leads to us becoming slaves to culture, rejecting common sense, compromising sound doctrine, accepting that which is worldly, convenient, ultimately rejecting the true and living God despite all the infallible proofs. That's what we end up doing. So in regards to having this flawed mindset of leaning to our own understanding, I'm gonna ask you now to turn in your Bibles to the book of Mark. Chapter two, by the power of the Lord we'll read verses one through nine. It's my opinion that this will bring this point of not getting the point home as I believe it ties into the Trinity and many other aspects contained within the scriptures. Book of Mark, chapter two. Reading verses one through nine. As the word of God reads, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come, in verse two. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men, verse 3, came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Keep that in mind. A paralyzed man carried by four of them. Verse 4, since they could not get, get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above by digging through it and then lowered the man that the man was lying on. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, 
He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Stop there. I can't skip over this part in verse 3. There were four men carrying this paralyzed man. Now, go back to your paramedic days. Look, look at the TV. You see a stretcher. It's two people carrying. One on the end with two, other on the end with two. This is signifying this man was big. It took four to carry him. But it also goes to show why Jesus said, your faith Look at their faith. Why? Because they had to climb on the roof with this heavy man, four of them, all the way up and then dig a hole so they can lower him down next to Jesus. The quick lesson here is that we should do whatever it takes to get next to Jesus. Then we'll be healed as well. That's the quick note for that one. But anyway, continuing on in verse 6. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? In verse 8, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? In verse 9, here's the capstone. Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. They were right. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus showed them that, but they didn't get the point. They didn't want to get the point. It railed against their feelings and emotions or what they thought. They leaned to their own understanding and didn't recognize. Here's God in the flesh, Emmanuel. You don't get the point? And then Jesus says, what is it easy for me to say? Which one, what, what do you want me to say? Because I haven't said it this way that you think is right, the point is all there, it's infallible, and yet you still want to rail against it. Don't get the point. They didn't get the point who he was. They didn't want to get the point. You fail to see who I am, the great I am? You don't get the point. Well, what is easy for me to say? Trinity or Godhead? Do you get the point? Is there a point behind it? Does the scripture speak to it? Are there facts and proofs behind this? I believe they are. In fact, I would say I know they are by the scriptures. And you think about it. Ask yourself, does it prove this? Does the word of God show this? And does it demonstrate it? Of course it does. And as we bring the deity of the Holy Spirit to a close in this portion of our study, and perhaps this will be the capstone for the Holy Spirit. Two more quick points. And I believe this buries the debate. It kills it. First, we'll find it in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3 and verse 16. We read the following. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. It's key, training in righteousness. Some translations read, all scripture is inspired by God, which further promotes its divine nature by the means of a life-giving source from God, in agreement with God, yet acting with complete independence of God. It's amazing. When Jesus appeared to the disciples after his crucifixion, he would say these words captured in the book of John chapter 20, and 20, chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. Again, Jesus said, speaking to him, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sent to you. In verse 22. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And finally, in regards to the Holy Spirit, we get to the final point of scripture in the Bible. And you probably know where I'm going because it's the most pointed. And if we would teach it this way, I think this is the only one we would have to go to at all. And it is none other than the unforgivable or unpardonable sin. It's captured in three of the gospels. We have for us the most fascinating piece of scripture in regards to the Holy Spirit. Most detailed version coming out of the gospel of Matthew. Again, this is all well known. I know you know it, but if applied properly, 
and faithfully, it is so pointed, it just crushes everything in regards to this. Jesus Christ speaking would say the following in chapter 12 of Matthew beginning in verse 31, and I'll read. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Verse 32, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is in the Bible. And without getting into any prolonged discussion, let us just focus on one word, just one, one word of that. And that's blasphemy. That's the key word, blasphemy. In the Jewish culture and inside the Hebrew language and everywhere in the Old Testament, the word blasphemy is only used to disgrace God. Let me say it a different way. It's only a God word. Jesus knew that they knew this. So he says blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven because he understood that they would understand blasphemy. You could only blaspheme God. You can't blaspheme a man. Blasphemy is only God. That's it. And that's why Jesus used such a pointed tact. It's amazing. Walter A. L. Wells' first definition of blasphemy in the Encyclopedia of the Bible reads the following. Blasphemy, profane or contemptuous speech or writing about or action toward God. That's what it is. In America, we use blasphemy for everything. Blasphemy is, he blaspheming me. Blas That's not how it was. This is not how the Old Testament viewed it, and that's why Jesus said it to them, so they will understand exactly how important it is about the Holy Spirit. A few moments ago, we were discussing the scriptures being God-breathed or inspired by God via his Holy Spirit. Is it possible that this blasphemy is those who reject the Holy Word of God? It's been God-breathed, right? Is it possible? Absolutely, I believe. Could it be because people who don't believe in the Holy Spirit, the works of the Holy Spirit are done. There are no, Holy Spirit is just gone. It's like, kind of like hibernation. <laughs> be back sometime soon, maybe, we don't know. Could it be, could that be blasphemy, railing against the Holy Spirit? Why would Jesus say what he said? This did not come from any other author. It came from the Son of Man. Makes it significant. And I'm sure there are more suggestions, but I'm quite sure also that I don't have to worry about it and you don't have to worry about it. Because I believe that we believe in the Holy Spirit. We pray for the Holy Spirit. We do everything we can by the Spirit. For it is written, if we live by the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.25. What I'm more amazed about is how we even get to this point. Christians especially, don't understand it. So, that was the bulk of it. And let's move to Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead who exhibits the same attributes as the Holy Spirit, being there from the beginning, non-created, fully God, meaning eternal, creator of all, and able to do the most magnificent thing, and that is give life, eternal life. And this is, this should kill it right here. We should be done after this and go home. And I am so confused why people are confused about this passage. One of the greatest ones, and everybody knows it, so we'll just read it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Uh, that, that covers all the attributes. That's it. That's it. All members, divine, distinctive, 
Completeness is why it's so important. And it's all for God's glory. Oh, it had to be this way. We're going to see it had to be this way. Had to be this way. And it has to be this way. The scriptures will continue to show Jesus as the creator captured in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. As the word of God reads, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 16, verse 16, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things... All things have been created through him and for him. In verse 17, he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together or all things consist. In regards to all things consisting or holding together by our Lord Jesus Christ, Albert Barnes would write the following. I really like this. The meaning is that they are kept in their present state. Their existence, order, and arrangement are continued by his power. If unsupported by him, they would fall into disorder or sink back to nothing. If this is the proper interpretation, which I believe it is, then it is the ascription to Christ of infinite power, for nothing less could be sufficient to uphold the universe, and of infinite wisdom, for this is needed to preserve the harmonious actions of the suns and systems of which it is composed. None could do this but one who is divine. And hence, why we see the reason why he is represented as the image of the invisible God. He is the great and glorious ever active agent by whom the perfections of God are made known. Wonderful statement, and as accurate as could be. And as we continue with Jesus and God's oneness in the scriptures, we also see in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6, we read the following. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Do we see the synergy here? You can't take it away. You could try to, but it doesn't work. This is the oneness, God the Father and the Son. There's no disconnect here. But where's the disconnect with many of our Christians? Let's stop allowing Satan and his minions to bring the doctrine of demons in the house and try to tell us that this doesn't work. The scriptures speak to it. And this leads us to the final verse that we will look at pertaining to the oneness of Jesus and God. And this verse is well known, just as the majority of them that we read tonight. John 10, verse 30, needs no introduction, very simple. I and the Father are one. This is what Jesus spoke. He said it. It is simple. Why, why do we argue things? What, what else could he possibly say to, to get people to get the point? So, and with that, we're going to move to the oneness of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We've already done that, so we're going to do one more verse in regards to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So, we're going to do this a little different, though. We're going to begin with the conception of Jesus, which is the work of the Holy Spirit completed by God the Father, which brought about the Holy One, Jesus Christ. We're going to see this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, picking it up in verse 34. Mary is responding to the angel Gabriel and is announcing what her condition would soon be. As the Word of God reads, How would this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. 
This speaks to the Holy Spirit being in our Lord from conception. There's no disconnect. There was no, okay, in this period, there will not be us. No, it was always connected. The Word of God says, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Then the one to be born be Jesus Christ. Known, the Holy Spirit, known to be with Jesus from the beginning, demonstrating that all important, never being separated until the fulfillment of the cross. And the only time, if you look in the scriptures, the only time that Jesus would say, God, my God, my God. Every other time he called the Father. And there's a second piece of this too, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is Psalm 22. It's David in the spirit writing about the crucifixion all them years before. Read Psalm 22 and be blessed and understand the connection of that prophecy about our Savior on Calvary. It is amazing. Time won't permit us to go through it tonight. But the Holy Spirit would also be alongside of Jesus Christ, guiding him as it is written in Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It said, the word of God reads, <clears throat> Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And in verse 18 of the same chapter, the word of God reads the following. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. It's Jesus quoting Isaiah. So what we see in addition to this continuous connection of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, we see exactly what the pastor was talking about last month. The Holy Spirit being in you, alongside you, and upon you. Amazing. And we have it right there with our Lord Jesus Christ, never separated from the Holy Spirit. And now, with the Holy Spirit and the person of Jesus Christ of the Trinity somewhat expounded upon in regards to this study, it all reveals God. If you want to know more about God, pick up the Bible. Everything in there is for God's purpose about Jesus Christ dictated by the Holy Spirit. Say it again. These two, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit being expound upon, reveals God. Automatically, God's in the center. Is God ordained? I hope you feel that. It's all going to come full circle here in a second. I promise the Lord is so faithful. And our true and living God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6.4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God the Lord is one. This sounds a lot like 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Remember we just read that? They live for God. God created all things. They live for Christ. Christ created all things. See that? You can't separate them at all. Elohim, plural name and nature for God, who is one. Complete control always been in control and always will be. And so when we bring this all together of why this is so important, okay, I think we get the point, but why is it so important? How can I use this? What does it mean? So, their independent work can never be disconnected. What we find is that this united Everlasting communion has to be, as it is, in a complete agreement with one another. From the beginning, ever existing, never once separated in thought and what was going on. Let me put it to you this way. Everything that God has done, Jesus agrees with. Everything Jesus has done, God and the Holy Spirit agree with. Everything the Holy Spirit has done, God and Jesus agree with. From the beginning, it was ordained. They are in complete agreement, complete alignment for everything that was and is to come. 
never disconnected in thought. There's no contradiction between the Godhead. It will never be. So the application for us as Christians can be found nowhere else but the Bible itself. And here's why. I, along with many of you, have heard many people, especially professing Christians, which hurts, that they say this. Well, Jesus never said so-and-so and so-and-so. That was in the Old Testament. What you have just done or trying to do is disconnect the Son from the Father. You can't do that. That's why it's so important to understand this basic concept of the Godhead in complete agreement, never disconnected. Christians also and other people say, well, you know, God didn't say that. That was written in this book, but it's not over here. Trying to disconnect God from Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Worse off, and here's my worst favorite, if I could say it that way. When people say that the Bible was written by men. Okay, some 44 authors penned the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when you're saying that it was men that wrote the Bible by themselves with no active agent, which you're claiming, you're stripping the Holy Spirit, the, you're blaspheming. That unpardonable sin, that's what you're doing when you say that man has wrote the Bible. I would urge you to reconsider your thoughts because that is the sin that will never be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. It's important as Christians we understand this agreeable nature of the Godhead because what it does for you and I is keep the Holy Scriptures intact. It's funny when people also say, well, I don't know what version to use of the Bible. I'm not sure. Pick one up. <laughs> Start there. And if you are so bent on, I really want to get close to, get a Hebrew Bible. Amen. Get the Septuagint. Do whatever you think, what you need. But if you feel that God cannot keep together his word, you have a problem. Throughout the ages, it is the spirit that is keeping this word together. And he said that his word will never pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. That is the active power of the Holy Spirit because it was penned by those men blessed and ordained by God with the Holy Spirit in them. Forever connected, united to God by that spirit, never to be separated. So you cannot say that Jesus didn't say this because whatever the Bible says, Jesus agrees with. God agrees with. The Holy Spirit brought it about by the power of Almighty God. So that's how we make sure that we stay grounded because we have a concept of this Godhead that is so important and critical to our learning and understanding. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness for a reason. One of them is what we just discussed to demonstrate the requirement of this wonderful communion that perfectly completes the work, the word, and the will of the true and living God. Let's pray. Why don't y'all stand? We'll pray. Loving Heavenly Father, it is by your power and authority that this all makes perfect sense. We are in alignment and agreement with you as well because it is by your power, the power of that Holy Spirit that we consist. We stay here protected by your spirit and by your word and by your majestic ways. We thank you, Lord, and we ask that you would just put this in our hearts for the usefulness of our walk with you and for the furtherance of your mighty kingdom. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen.